God's good and all the time. God is good. Our first lesson is from the book of Genesis, chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. And I'll bless you, and I'll make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and her brother's son Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak at Morah. And at that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. And from there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. Our second lesson is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning verses 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when, but when he had heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The wedding feast. Your guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days are coming when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshruck cloth on an old cloth cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak and the worst hair is made. Neither is new wine put in old wine skins. <coughs> Otherwise the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, so both are preserved. <coughs> message is entitled, Water Under the Bridge. When I was a young boy, my parents used to take the family every year to a friend's of the family's hunting camp. And virtually every week, or once a week, every, every summer, we'd go to this camp. It was only a tar paper shack on, you know, out in the middle of the Allegheny National Forest. It, but for me, it had two really amazing things going for it. Out the back door was a mountain. On the other side, in front of the camp, across the road, was the south branch of the Tynesta Creek. Now, the mountain was the home of deer and bear, and it was also the place where I would learn how to hunt. The Tynesta Creek was filled with stalked rainbow trout and also native brownies. And even today, that stretch of mountain and creek, it, it's still for me a little piece of heaven. Um, as a little boy, I was enamored with a swaying bridge that crossed that, that creek just up, upstream from the camp. And I used to love how I could make it sway when I'd jump on it when I had one or two of my, my squeamish sisters on that, that swaying bridge with me at the same time. Well. Over the years, the swaying bridge began to show the effects of age and time. And uh, first, the wood decking began to rot, and it fell into the creek. And then some of the cables snapped. And finally, some of the trees to which the cables were anchored, they fell over and they dropped. 
you know, the, the cables dropped into the creek. An ice jam or two in succeeding winters, um, that erased all sign of, of that swaying bridge. And, uh, you know, a time that meant so much to me as a, a child. I've seen a lot of things come and a lot of things go during the course of my life. A lot of the people that have meant so much to me during the course of my, my life have, well, they've now gone home to be with the Lord. And many of the places where I used to roam as a child, places I even used to go rabbit hunting, they either have shopping malls sitting on them or there's a house or, you know, something else. During the course of, of my life, a lot of water has flowed under those, that bridge. And I guess whoever said you can't put your finger into the same stream, stream twice, they really weren't fooling. And that's simply because the water is constantly flowing under the bridge on its way to the sea. Now, this brings me to a great truth that is contained in both of today's scripture readings. Our past does not have to define us. Not in God's eyes. Now, everybody else might try to put us in some kind of a box and categorize us by the way we used to be before the Lord got a hold of us and started working in our lives. And while everybody else on the planet might write us off as yesterday's news or uh, just water under the bridge, God sees us as huge, untapped potential. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I'll bless you and make your name great. <clears throat> so that you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And the one that curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Iran. Now, a lot of people would look at someone Abram's age and write him off as being on the downhill slide of life. I mean, you know. But yet, none of the things that Abram was or would be known for, remembered for, had even yet happened in his life. Neither Ishmael nor Isaac had been born yet. Abram hadn't become known as that fierce warrior, chieftain, a man to be reckoned with, a man totally sold out to God. Abram hadn't yet pleaded with God for the life of the righteous who lived amongst them, you know, and amongst all the depraved sinners of the world. None of the things that we associate with the Abrahamic covenant had been put into motion yet except God calling Abram out of his father's house. Now up until the time God called Abram from his father's house, he'd been totally immersed in the pagan ways of the culture in his world. And that God saw in him a potential that was lacking in all those around him. No matter what his past, you know, had been known, what he'd been known for, God promised Abram a fresh start, a new beginning, especially for those to be born of him. So Abram took his wife, Sarah, and his brother's son's lot, and uh, all possessions they gathered, all the persons whom they'd acquired in Ron, they set forth to the land of Canaan. And when they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, to the oak at, at Morah. And at that time, Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the, on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. Because God was working in Abram's life. Everywhere Abram went, every place, everything he did, it would take on new meaning and new purpose for all those who followed him. Because to them would come the promise. And because of his faithful response 
to God's call. Abram was, was privileged to be front and center as God began to carve out a life for a people who would be chosen to bear his name and to make his ways known amongst the nations. Now sometimes Abram would go with the flow. Other times he would forge against the tides coming against him with everything he had, yet with every step he took. He knew that God was with him each and every step of the way. Now in our second lesson, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner at the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he had heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners. Now, in the eyes of his fellow Jews, Matthew had B.O., I mean, the stench, the foul stench of his very breath. It was thought to pollute the air. That's what the people of his own blood and nationality thought. You see, everybody who knew Matthew, they knew he was a tax collector. They knew what he was. Only Jesus had a clue as to whom he could become. Now, in the eyes of his fellow Jews, he was simply a lowly turncoat, a tax collector. He was a traitor, and he was a collaborator with the Romans, and he was out in their eyes just to defraud all of his countrymen. They hated him with a passion. They hated him with a passion that goes beyond words. And here the Lord was asking him to join him and become one of his disciples. Now, this definitely had to have been uncharted waters for the rest of Jesus' disciples who he had already gathered to himself, and also they were invited to Matthew's table. Now, after Matthew began to follow the Lord, he held a dinner at his house, sort of like a going away, I guess, before he left everything behind. Now, since he invited many of his associates to the dinner, many tax collectors and many sinners were present. Now, you can be sure that not only were Jesus' existing disciples uncomfortable by this, but... So were the Pharisees, who were also in attendance. Not only was this going to be a teachable moment for the disciples, but it would become food for thought for the high and mighty Pharisees among them. When Jesus said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go learn what this means. I, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I've come to call not the righteous but sinners. What he was alluding to was Hosea. Uh, chapter 6, verse 6. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Now, this was an in-your-face jab at the high and mighty Pharisees and their holier-than-thou attitude. But now as things are really starting to heat up, as everybody's actually digesting what the Lord had just said, what he's implying, um, not only did the Pharisees question Jesus' you know, presence at that, that feast with tax collectors and sinners, but also the disciples of John. <clears throat> now, we're not sure if these were the other disciples of John or if they were Andrew and you know, some of John's previous disciples that had you know, transferred over to become disciples of Jesus. But anyhow, they asked Jesus a question about taking part in such feasts. Now, it was right for John and his disciples to, to fast, for they were calling people to repentance, you know, and they were calling people to the coming kingdom that Jesus himself would usher in. But John's disciples asked why Jesus' men were, were not fasting also, you know, they weren't abstaining. Now Jesus answered that the kingdom is like a great feast. And in this case, it would actually be the greatest of all feasts. It would be the wedding banquet. And, and since the king was now present, 
it was actually inappropriate for him or for his disciples to fast. At a wedding, people are happy and they're eating and they're, they're not mourning, they're not fasting. Jesus did, however, anticipate the time when he would be taken from them. Um, he was anticipating the time when his own people would reject him. And he talked about the time when the bridegroom would be taken from them. And then he began picturing the, the difference between the relationship of his ministry and the ministry that John the Baptist had known. You know, John was a reformer. And he was trying to bring about repentance among his own people, among those steeped in the traditions of, of Judaism. Jesus, however, he wasn't there to patch up, you know, the old system. He wasn't about to sew an unshrunk piece of cloth on an old garment, which would tear, or, or putting new wine in old wineskins, which would burst, because it had already been stretched out to their breaking point. His purpose was to bring in something new. And according to the Lord, true righteousness is not built upon the law, and certainly not upon Pharisaic traditions. Now, you can be sure those in attendance, they got this uh, new thing idea that Jesus was doing. But the part about him being the bridegroom that was something they hadn't quite come to grips with. Not only was this a new teaching, but in their, their minds, this is an act of, of blasphemy. And a very real part of them was recoiling at what he was saying about his relationship with his Father in Heaven. And they were not on board with this. Now, water is going to flow downstream, no matter how much we hate to think about it. Change does happen. On that south branch of the Tynesta Creek of my childhood, great snags happen all the time. Large trees fall across the creek, debris fall flowing downstream, they get caught up in the current, they create pools. And, and you know, those pools make great fishing holes. Um, but in a very similar way, great snags happen in the life of, of God's people. Now, the Pharisees had made a ministry out of working in and around all these snags that had occurred, you know, in the life of the Jewish people. And they, they were quite comfortable around things the way they were. Now, from our Lord's teaching and ministry, it becomes quite clear that he'd actually prefer some ice jams to come barreling down the creek and, and break up some of those snags that were tripping up his people. And so he brought with it a new teaching that revealed more about the will of God than it did the conventions of the Pharisees and the spiritual watchkeepers of, of the people. Quite frankly, Jesus was on a collision course with those who were quite comfortable with things the way they were. Judaism, every bit as much as Christianity and the Christian movement, it hasn't always been quite in line with God's plan or God's will for his people. Now the simple truth is, it's a very fine line <clears throat> to try to be walking that doesn't deviate from the path of the disciple, you know, onto the trail of the Pharisee. Sometimes it's going with the flow. And going with the flow only serves to further take us away from the heart of God. Now, like it or not, we do live in such a time as this. There are ice jams coming down the creek. They are going to rock our world. I don't expect the coming week in Erie for our annual conference. I don't think it's going to be business as usual. A lot of what I've been accustomed to, a lot of you know what we've been accustomed to, are probably going to be washed away. Our task is to keep to the higher ground. When we're rooted in Scripture, and when we're committed to following where the Master leads us, we will see the victory of our God. Now, sometimes that means we have to change. Other times it means we're not the ones doing the changing, but everybody else around us. When we walk with our God, 
we can know with absolute assurance that he's walking with us as well. Both Abram and Matthew became usable vessels in the hands of our God. They only did this because they let go and they let God. And and we, we can do no less. And we can know that the promises of God or for, uh, are for us just as much as they were for them in the uncertain days that are coming, both in our church as well as to our culture. I encourage you to keep the faith. Fight the good fight. And above all, welcome the Lord into every nook and cranny of your life. The kingdom blessings are for all of those who will walk in faith believing. And we can rest assured our God is going to take care of all the rest. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we do ask your anointing and blessing. We know, Lord, that floods come and floods go. We know, Lord, that fire strikes fear into the heart of even the most staunch believers. And there will be days of both fire and water descending upon your people in these uncertain days. We pray, Lord, that we would keep the faith we would hold fast to the truths that you've implanted in our hearts. We give you thanks and praise all in Christ's holy name. Amen.